Queen and the Black Rose of Queen, I wanted to give a shout out to Ring IQ Boxing and remember to tune in to the motherfucking relay. Welcome to the motherfucking relay. We're covering today's top boxing news. Ow! Okay, we'll start with this. I was actually tagged to this post by none other than the Black Rose herself, Zarina McCoy. This post by way of her Instagram stories where she alleges, no disrespect to Carly Skelly, but tell me why Matchroom contacted me to be the opponent for this fight, and I gladly accepted, but was turned down by the champs team. Jamie Mitchell, Dr. Smoltz. That's what Zarina's saying. She added, 7-0-2 versus 9-0-0 sounds way better than 4-0-1. Zarina's not the first fighter that said Jamie Mitchell was being very selective. I vaguely recall one of my favorite unbeaten prospects, Melissa Odessa, saying something very similar, saying the exact same thing. That was before Jamie Mitchell beat Shannon Courtney. Which lends credence to the notion that Team Mitchell rejected Team McCoy. The real McCoy. I'll tell you something, I think that would have been a bad stylistic matchup for Jamie Mitchell. Jamie Mitchell, whose base style is akin to that of a boxer puncher's, whereas Arena McCoy is more of a pure boxer, completely oh. defensively minded, efficient, economic. Keeps it long, loose, and on the move. On the Straight move. shots from the outside, unless we forget Zarina McCoy is a southpaw. We know how tricky those southpaws can be for an orthodox fighter. Zarina's base style wouldn't do Jamie's any favors. I'm just giving it to you straight. It's the only way I know how to give it to you. The Carly Thumper Skelly fight is a more winnable fight than the Zarina McCoy fight would have been for Jamie Mitchell based on styles and styles as we all know. They make fights. So does that mean Carly Skelly beats Zarina McCoy? No, there still is the level at which the fighter operates. For example, if Zarina McCoy is an A-level pure boxer and Carly Skelly is, say, a B-level pressure fighter, yeah, Carly's got the right style for the job, but she's not operating at the same level oh. as a Zarina McCoy. Thus, Zarina could still win that fight. That's the way that breaks down. A pure boxer on the level of a Carly Skelly is an Amy Timlin. It's no coincidence that their fight was ruled a draw. It's no coincidence that it was in some ways an even fight. It's no coincidence that Amy Timlin struggled. Just like it's no coincidence that Amy Timlin suffered her first professional loss at the hands of the very experienced pressure fighter, Mary Romero, who... Mary's got the same base style as Carly Skelly, but she's a lot more experienced. And that's why Mary's victory over Amy Timlin was quite decisive, because not only did she have the right base style for the job, she was operating at a level higher, a level above Amy Timlin, who was still green around the gills, still needed more experience. Pressure fighters have an advantage over pure boxers. Though the level at which they compete is equally important. Better still, this segment is in reference to Zarina McCoy's allegation that the Jamie Mitchell people, they didn't want to know. They didn't want no parts of her. And I can believe that. I can believe that because I saw Melissa Odessa say something similar. Oh. Melissa Odessa, who's more akin to a boxer puncher, like Jamie Mitchell is a boxer puncher, though I will say, I think Melissa's operating at a level above. I think she's just above Jamie Mitchell. And I believe the Maria Cecilia Roman fight is evidence of that. Maria Cecilia Roman is a lot more experienced than Jamie Mitchell, a lot more experienced than Shannon Courtney and Ebony Bridges, and a lot of girls in that division, and you never would have known how much more pro experience she has than Melissa Odessa if you saw the fight if you saw the fight looked like they were on the same level better still it appears that young Zarina McCoy is on matchrooms radar as they knew to contact her as a potential opponent option for Jamie Mitchell and even though Jamie turned down the fight thereby dodging that bullet the silver lining here is the saving grace the light at the end of the tunnel is that Zarina is on Matchroom's radar. So she didn't get to capitalize off this opportunity. That's fine. She's young. She's got plenty of time. Perhaps she will get to capitalize on another should she be afforded one. The saving grace and the silver lining here for me is that Matchroom is aware of this young fighter who I think is very capable, is a blue chip prospect. She's got a lot of personality this kid. And the talent to boot. That's the kind of marriage you're looking for in a fighter. The marriage of class, charisma, and caliber. The caliber of the fighter, the level at which they compete and can compete if they are properly groomed. I hope that Matchroom extends another opportunity to this young fighter or perhaps decides to sign her because I'm telling you, this kid's got it. 
Another news, an article posted by Kevin Ioli by way of Yahoo Sports. George Foreman defends Bob Arum as promoter blasts Terrence Crawford's vile claims of racism. Terrence Crawford, the number two pound for pound fighter in the world and the world's best welterweight among them, Crawford filed a lawsuit seeking nearly 10 million against Arum and top rank on Tuesday, last Tuesday, in a Nevada district court. The gist of Crawford's suit against Arum, though, is that Arum and his company are racist and treat black fighters poorly. George George Foreman, one of the many legendary black boxers Aram has promoted to great heights and staggering riches, was shocked at Crawford's allegation. The former heavyweight champion was promoted by Aram in his second act following his comeback after a 10-year retirement. Foreman regained the title by knocking out Michael Mora at 45 years old in a fight promoted by Aram. He's not a saint. But Bob Arum is one of the finest men I know, said Foreman, who celebrated his 73rd birthday on Monday, last Monday. You could call me about 25 other guys, 30 other guys, and ask me that question, and I wouldn't return the call, but not this one, nuh-uh. He's got a passion for his fellow man. In his suit, Crawford alleges that Top Rank breached its contracts with him and, in fact, defrauded him into entering agreements in the first place. He said in the suit that Top Rank got Crawford to agree to fight Eggy Digo Cavaliauskas in order to fulfill an obligation to ESPN, its TV partner, and not because it was best for his career. A portion of the suit reads, Top Rank fraudulently promised to arrange for Crawford to fight Errol Spence Jr. despite knowing that Top Rank could never deliver the promised match. Top Rank also failed to deliver a promised second bout under the party's promotional rights agreement. Top Rank apparently had no qualms about lying to a black fighter or failing to respect its contractual obligations to him, though it would never treat one of its white fighters with such blatant disrespect. It's a ridiculous statement because Aram has battled over the years with people of all races, colors, and religions. He's aggressive, often irascible, and rarely bites his lip and often puts his foot in his mouth. But few have ever accused Aram of being racist over the years. Yeah, he's an equal opportunity asshole. It's not that Bob Aram isn't an asshole. He's an asshole. But he's an equal opportunity asshole. Yeah, he's an asshole. He can be, but where do you get that him being an asshole constitutes a racial bias against you and in favor of someone else? You have to prove that. When you go as far as Terrence and his attorney did. In 2020, Aram was asked if he thought Crawford would re-sign to top rank when his contract expired in 2021. Aram responded angrily by flippantly saying, I could build a house in Beverly Hills on the money I've lost on him in his last three fights. That might not have been the best way to build quality working relationship between them, but top rank reportedly lost 20 million in all promoting Crawford fights and 3 million on his last fight against Sean Porter. Aram's anger at Crawford wasn't because he was black, it's because Crawford hasn't done much to try to help his own cause. And his fights are poor sellers. Aram released a statement to Yahoo Sports in which he denied any allegations of racism. Bud Crawford's lawsuit against Top Rank is frivolous, Aram wrote. Its vile accusations of racism are reckless and indefensible. He knows it and his lawyer, Brian J. Friedman knows it. I have spent my entire working life as a champion of black boxes, Latino boxes, and other boxes of color. I have no doubt the court will see Crawford's case for the malicious extortion attempt that it is. And that has yet to be determined. We don't know what Terrence Crawford might offer up as evidence of this alleged racial bias he claims Bob Arum and Top Rank have. Tony London is a black promoter who currently has 14 fighters under contract with Top Rank, 12 of whom are black. Leonard said not only hasn't he ever experienced racism from Top Rank, he's never experienced racism from anyone he's worked with in boxing. Leonard told Yahoo Sports. I ain't experienced nothing like that when told Crawford accused top rank of racism. He went on to defend Aram and question why Crawford would make that kind of an allegation. Bob, he's my man. I don't got no problem with Bob, Leonard said. I never have. And let me tell you, I wouldn't do business with somebody I didn't like, no matter how much money I could make. I got nothing bad to say about Bob. Now, how many character references in favor of Bob Aram does that bring us to? George Foreman said, it breaks my heart to hear Crawford accuse Aram of racism. Aram has promoted many of the top black stars of the last 60 years, including Foreman, Muhammad Ali, Sugar Ray Leonard, Marvelous Marvin Hagler, Tommy Hearns, Floyd Mayweather Jr., and others. He's been close with many of them, but none more so than with Hagler, the former middleweight champion who died last year. 
Aram and Hagler were so close that there was never a promotional contract between them and they operated on a handshake. Aram has three pictures on the wall in his office and all are of black boxers, Ali, Foreman, and Hagler. Foreman said after he knocked out, Michael Moore would have won the title. He wanted to go kneel in the corner and pray. He told his brother to make sure no one bothered him and allowed him to complete his prayer. While he was still praying, he was bear hugged by an exuberant Aram. He gave me the most passionate hug and said, George, praise the Lord, Foreman said. For someone to accuse a guy like that of racism, it's wrong. But you know what they say? All is fair in love and more. And, and that's what this is. This is a war where all bets are off and you get to say whatever you want about whoever you want, whether it's true or not. A lot of guys have already made up their minds. A lot of people that are very angry at me when I say that Bob Arum in a court of law, he's innocent until proven guilty and the burden of proof is on the accuser, not the accused. When it comes to top rank failing to promote Crawford in the way that he wanted to be promoted and deliver him certain fights that he really wanted, well, there are several contributing factors that could have led to that, not exclusive to a racial bias, oh. let alone one against Terrence Crawford. There's a lot of reasons things could have happened the way that they did. But you're saying the reason things happen the way they happen is due to a racial bias and systemic racism at top rank. Okay, well, you've got to prove that. Reading this, I was surprised how similar my sentiments were to George Foreman's sentiments. This article was published last week, though. I didn't get the chance to read it until this week, and I was surprised to see that I said the exact same thing that George was saying, that Bob Arum, he's no saint. But does that make him a bigot? So Terrence Crawford is disgruntled. He's unhappy. He's not the first fighter the top rank promoted that ended up disgruntled and unhappy. Teofimo Lopez, Mikey Garcia, Floyd Mayweather Jr. Do all these guys look alike? So Lomachenko, a Caucasian fighter. He suspected foul play after the Lopez fight based on how the fight was scored. Do all these guys look alike? You got a lot of guys still belly aching because Bob Arum years ago called Guillermo Vergandiao a boring fighter. Big fucking deal. He said the same thing just the other day about Dimitri Bivol. Do all these guys look alike? The 26 page complaint says he says mean things about Al Heyman. Big fucking deal. He says mean things about Eddie Hearn. Do all these guys look alike? From what I can see, Bob's a bit of an asshole but he's an equal opportunity asshole. He's been that asshole to a lot of fucking people. Him being an asshole doesn't make him a bigot by default. An article published by Steve Kim lends insight onto the actual legalese of the matter. In spite of what is grabbing people's attention about this story, the actual complaint and the actual case is in reference to a breach of contract. Though that does beg the question as to why Terrence Crawford and his attorney are alleging a racial bias. As stated, there are several contributing factors that could have led to Terrence Crawford being as disgruntled as he is. Not exclusive to an alleged racial bias that... A bias that he claims affected how he was being promoted. A bias against black fighters and a bias in favor of white and Latino fighters because I'm sure all of Bob's Latino fighters... Oh yeah, they've all been happy campers. One of his white fighters, Vasil Lomachenko, I'm sure he was very pleased with the scoring in his fight against Teofimo Lopez. I'm sure he was very happy. Now, Steve Kim and the people over there at Snack spoke to an attorney in reference to this case, and he said they make no mention of the fact that the second fight of the second year of the 2018 contract couldn't have been accomplished because of COVID, which Aram is going to claim under force majeure. This sentiment is echoed by another source, force majeure. In its simplest terms, it means an act of God that prevents a contract from being executed. The prophet says they were supposed to get them two fights a year and they didn't. But during at least one of those years, the entire world was dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. The article continues, in 2020, as the worldwide pandemic hit, many world-class boxers were only able to fight once during that calendar year. If only getting one fight that year was an issue and they feel they were owed this fight, they could have easily brought this up to top rank and asked that this fight be done a while ago or just added on to the existing contract, pointed out the Boxing Insider. The other main issue being brought up in this suit is that Crawford's side claims that they agreed upon the December 2019 bout against Igas Kavalyowskis with the promise of a showdown with Spence to come. They claim that there was a Spence bonus of $900,000 if a bout with him could not be secured by the end of 2020. I don't know under what circumstances that they'd have to pay that, our source admitted. But if they promised to pay that, if they couldn't make a Spence fight by a certain date, then they would have to pay it. That's the the only thing in the whole complaint that is meritorious. The only thing that could be. And the only way it is is if Terrence Crawford has it in writing. It seems a very strange thing for Top Rank and Bob Arum 
to have promised Terence Crawford, given the circumstances, they're all the same. If Terence has it in writing... They're on the hook $900,000. They're on the hook for $900,000. The attorney added, it forces Aram to do everything in his power to make the Spence fight. One of the major hurdles in making a Spence versus Crawford fight is that Spence is represented by the rival PBC. Spence in recent years hadn't been shy in stating that his rival was on the wrong side of the street, which meant that while Spence had options at 147, Crawford was stuck with lesser fights for which he was well compensated. Crawford's got to have it in writing they made that promise. Though the entire premise of this alleged promise seems a little bit divisive when, had he not fought Agidigas Kavaliaskas, he would have had to forfeit his WBO title to him, lest we forget. Igas was his mandatory. The article continues, many others will point on Aram's political past where he served on the Kennedy administration and began his career in boxing promoting the exiled Muhammad Ali and then many other black boxes of distinction. Recently, his his company has signed the likes of Keyshawn Davis and Kelvin Davis, Troy Isley, Jahi Tucker, Tiger Johnson, Abdullah Mason, Bruce Carrington, and Kerry Goldston, among others, all of whom are black. None of this may have anything to do with the actual merits of their defense. But it speaks to whether or not Top Rank as a company is biased against black fighters when they seem to be signing so many of them. If top Rank is such an unhospitable environment for black boxes, why do so many of them keep signing to Top Rank? Why aren't they signing to the PBC? The the article continues, some will say, that still doesn't mean that Crawford wasn't the victim of bigotry and prejudice. They will have ample opportunity to prove that in the upcoming months. Aram has had other fighters leave him. Mayweather, Oscar De La Hoya, Miguel Cotto. History suggests that more will come from their pipeline. You could argue that he could have done better with Crawford, been more diplomatic at certain points, but... Does that make Aram a racist? The burden of proof is on Crawford to prove that it led to top rank breaching their promotional agreement. I.e. Crawford's got to prove that a racial bias led to top rank and Bob Aram not honoring their existing agreement, their existing contract. And I think, given everything that's been said, well... It's very hard to prove. It's open to interpretation. You say this guy's a shitty businessman. Doesn't honor the terms of engagement. Doesn't honor his contracts. Does that make him a bigot by default, or is that just him being a shitty businessman? Bob Arum being insensitive about the situation with Terrence Crawford and how much money he's lost trying to promote his fights. That might make him an asshole. It might. That doesn't make him a bigot. I'm telling you, short of damning audio or video. Because that's what he would need. Short of that, it's all open to interpretation, and Crawford's interpretation of it might be the top rank don't like promoting black boxes, but somebody else's interpretation of it, like George Foreman, like Tim Bradley, Antonio Leonard, Rashida Ali, might be something else entirely. So what the hell is supposed to make your word any better than theirs when that's all you got? You've got to show and prove. Because the burden of proof is on Terrence Crawford, it's not on Bob Arum. His attorney has to produce the documentation that constitutes the breach and simultaneously connect that breach to pattern behavior at top rank that can be characterized as a racial bias. And a breach in and of itself doesn't constitute a racial bias.